The CDC tells us that every 34 seconds, someone in the USA dies from cardiovascular disease, making 20% of American deaths. Those lucky enough to survive the ordeal through PCI or cabbage often go from taking no medications to lots of medications as factors leading to and implicated in heart disease, like smoking, um, diabetes, hypertension, are discovered while inpatient and require treatment. After a STEMI, meds include dual antiplatelet therapy, a statin, a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, and that's not even counting any associated comorbidities like type 2 diabetes or heart failure, each with their own set of two to four meds. We know from previous trials that statins in both patients with low CVD risk as well as those with intermediate CVD risk decrease the incidence of cardiovascular disease-related events, uh, um, heart-related death, CVAs, MIs. And we also know that the SPRINT trial showed that aggressive blood pressure control under 120 mmHGs in high-risk CVD patients decreases cardiovascular outcomes and increases overall survival. When we send these people to the resident clinic, the new PCP now has a patient with a zillion new meds who doesn't always want to deal with them. Similarly, empires here, the Holy Roman Empire after the Treaty of Westphalia, has the issue of a zillion different people linguistically, culturally, geographically, and historically, and doesn't really know what's going on. The purpose uh, of today's, what well, this is Journal Club, uh, will be to talk about the trends of consolidation, both medically and politically, as we go from an age of empires to um, the rise of nations, and in both cases, secure combination states. The Thirty Years' War had defined the past 30 years in Europe, and the wars of religion had defined the past 100 years since the 95 Theses. The Holy Roman Empire, each in bigger quotes than the last, is much like the medications we have coming out of the hospital. You have statins and austrians over here, with beta blockers and the Spanish Netherlands over there. Bohemia is hanging out with the ACE inhibitors, aspirins in Trento, and P2Y12 inhibitors down in Lorraine. To, it's too much to keep track of. All these pills, like the people in the whole Roman Empire, don't know each other. They're all separated more than geographically, and it's a mess. Empires are gigantic political and geographic units, usually under the command of one person, where the subjects, between various components, um, have no relation to each other, except, usually, through conquest. Um, see Austria-Hungary prior to the unpleasantness in the Balkans. Just as how an empire is ruled by one person, usually, much like patients, sometimes you get lucky and you'll have someone who considers all the players. Just as how for every Otto the Great who is able to get everyone involved, you may have a patient who is able to take all his meds. You may also get a Francis II and a patient who lets it all come crashing down. Although the fall of empires would take its biggest hit at the end of the First World War, the transition of the continent from a hodgepodge of empire to structured nations can be mirrored by the transition from the post-MI hodgepodge of meds to the polypill. Polypills have been around for over 20 years. Uh, we use them for things like HIV and hepatitis C. Um, usually it's to increase adherence since you absolutely want your patients with HIV to take their meds. Docs were tired of having patients with repeat heart attacks from non-adherence. Um, so on the back of several other trials, the SECURE trial was launched to try and make things less convoluted and more simplistic. A total of 2,499 people in France, Spain, Italy, Poland, Germany, and the Czech Republic were securely enrolled in the trial over the course of three years. And for those of you who are fans of Svante Pabo, Nobel Prize in Medicine winner this year, 2022, 
uh, for his work on genomes of archaeological sites. The study population is Y-chromosome haplogroups, R1b and R1a primarily. The trial, unlike previous trials with polypills, looked not at primary prevention but secondary prevention, so the unfortunate had already occurred. The inclusion criteria, patients with the, who had had a type 1 MI within six months and were either 75 or at least 65 with one or more of the following risk factors, diabetes, CKD, previous MI with PCI cabbage, or CVA. The exclusion criteria were those on oral anticoagulation, severe heart failure, renal or liver disease, AFib or any unresolved arrhythmia, or those living in a nursing home. The distinction is important as it implies a certain functional status that we may not see in our population. You will also note um, that this is our first case so far doing these things based in uh, only in Europe, which will have different demographics than the folks at home uh, here. Uh, there's still some similarities as we can kind of see. You got some, you got a bunch of people here with uh, with diabetes. You got smokers. They're hypertensive. Some of them have angina. So with these similarities, and similarly, empires and of course nations also have exclusion and inclusion criteria. Being a political rather than a social unit, the only inclusion criteria for empire tends to be conquest, and exclusion criteria is not conquered. Compare that to a nation defined by a people with several unifying factors who usually decide to live together, though not necessarily within a political boundary, a state. Usually there's a common history in some set of territory, a language, and a zillion other factors, music, food, clothes, whatever. Inclusion criteria for nations are usually ethno-linguistic and geographic. Think of Catalans and the Basques in Spain and parts of France. You have Bretons in France, Kurds in Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Though, much like the Kurds, these nations aren't all states. Uh, as we'll see with the Holy Roman Empire, as well as the Bourbon line in France, the dissolution of empires seems to go hand in hand with the emergence of a nation, and in some cases, the formation of a nation state. People in the trial were divided into either standard of care per the European cardiology norms or the polypill with the remaining uh, standard of care being left. The polypill had aspirin, 100 milligrams, satorvastatin, and 40 milligrams unless they were choosing to take a different dose or a different type of statin and either 2.5, 5, or 10 milligrams of ramipril that would be ramped up every three weeks as tolerated with the follow-up essentially every six months. Originally set as a non-inferiority trial, the idea was that if the hazard ratio had an upper bound on the 97.5% confidence interval of less than 1.37, it would be seen as non-inferior, meaning that when you look at your confidence interval, if the upper bound of the relative rate of the primary outcomes uh, was less than 1.373, you could say it was non-inferior. The study was powered at 90% to reject inferiority, which is above the usual 80% mark. Uh, if this was found to be positive, the study would have a power of 78% to detect superiority. It was not blinded, um, unlike the Holy Roman Empire, blinded by its own success. The polypole distribution is shown here, which had the plurality of people taking 2.5 milligrams of ramipril, which was also mirrored in the usual treatment arm with most people taking ramipril and the plurality in that group taking ramipril 2.5 milligrams. The 4,457 people in, arm of, in an arm of 819 is a typo. It's probably 458 since the 457 otherwise um, with these other two numbers here do not add up to 819. Uh, you will notice that in the besides aspirin, uh, statin, and ACE inhibitor meds in both groups, 94 to 95% of the people are taking a non-aspirin antiplatelet agent, which is close to 100. 
Uh, I'm not sure why it's not 100 since the 2015, 2017, and 2020 European Society of Cardiology guidelines recommend dual antiplatelet therapy and all their releases during the time of the trial, but it might have something to do with an inability to take DAPT, or since it's throughout quite a few centers and countries, access may vary. The 19th century saw the eventual dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire at the hands of Napoleon, and from it, a fierce sense of national unity in a series of several countries that exist today. Luxembourg, Belgium, Netherlands, Italy, um, and with time, Austria, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and uh, Slovakia. Just like the trial with the consolidation of variables, the large territories consolidated, um, most notably with um, Garibaldi in Italy in his red shirts starting in 1848, a great year for revolutions. After years of being part of various empires, including the Holy Roman Empire, Bonapartist France again, uh, and then uh, Habsburg again, Garibaldi's red shirts galvanized the region from the Alps to Sicily, um, though not without severe resistance, but would eventually unite the country we know today as Italy, famous for its pasta and aggressive fashion. It's a strange example of a nation state at first, as each region had its own dialect, though all had a shared history in a very specific area, and certainly did not like being under non-Italian um, rule. So what are we looking at? The primary outcome was a composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal type 1 MIs, non-fatal ischemic strokes, or urgent coronary revascularization. Secondary outcomes were divided into key and not key. Uh, key outcomes were like the primary outcomes, but the composite of non-fatal type 1 MI, non-fatal ischemic stroke, and cardiovascular disease was without need for revascularization. Non-key secondary outcomes included LDL and blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, as well as deaths of any kind. Notable characteristics were a majority of them were current or former smokers, uh, and over 40% had diabetes. The BMI in most of these people was 27, and the systolic blood pressure was 129, which is similar to the systolic blood pressure and BMI of a lot of people who fought in World War I, which really kind of marked the end of empires, uh, as they were traditionally constructed. Um, not long after, Britain and France would lose their colonial possessions, and in mainland Europe, Austria-Hungary was completely decimated, and the Ottomans completed their several hundred year decay. Out of the rubble, we have Russia losing, you can see all this stuff right here, Finland, Poland, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, um, Estonia, and the dissolution of Austria-Hungary leading to austria Hungary, um, and the creation of Yugoslavia, um, um, which uh, will eventually prove disastrous. We also have Czechoslovakia. So among the 2,466 valuable patients, the incidence of primary outcome events was significantly lower in the polypal group than in the usual care group. This was mainly a pooled effect with the greatest non-pooled contribution coming from a statistically significant decrease in cardiovascular death, though with a decrease in non-fatal ACS, ischemic stroke, and revascularization all present, but not statistically significant. Um, the rest of the deaths are listed right here. Uh, COVID, of course, uh, playing a role, as it seems to have done in uh, 2020. LDL levels, as well as blood pressures, were measured in addition to an assessment of medication adherence, which was presumed to be the impetus behind any improvements. The LDL and the polypill and usual care group uh, from baseline to 24 months was 85 and 83, going to 64 and 65 respectively. Systolic blood pressures went from a median of 130 to, interestingly enough, uh, 135 in uh, both groups. Kind of bizarre. 
the diastolic blood pressure story was pretty similar in that there was no differences in the median values prior to and at 24 months of therapy between the groups, 70 and 75 mmHGs, as we can see. Looking at satisfaction, people seem to be happier on the poly pill, but again, it wasn't blinded, but you know, it would be hard to, to do so considering how you, you're taking two fewer pills. And most importantly, how about compliance? Great success. People were statistically significantly more compliant with the medication regimen when it was less hassling. Here's a good summary graph. It's um, important to note that the number needed to treat here is 31. For context, the Paragon trial, the Sacubitral Valsartan, Valsartan trial, um, has a number needed to treat of 20. And the SPRINT trial, the aggressive blood pressure control to reduce cardiovascular mortality, is 62. So just as how you would control your patient's blood pressure, you might want to consider even more strongly giving them combo pills, given that number needed to treat. So this combination was pretty successful, and that's the way people usually feel about nation-states. Nation-states, certainly in the Western sense, have a fun set of rules that make them interesting. One, uh, there was an idea of citizenship where the laws legitimized by the people who have to follow it, who in turn have a say in what laws are made. This is usually different from the ideas of empire where you are a subject, not so much a citizen. Two is nationality, um, where any sort of tribal, ethnic, religious affiliations are mitigated by a commonality shared by all people and that they inhabit the same land and consent to living um, side by side, despite what may be wild differences, which is great for stability because you can't just go killing your neighbors for being different a la Hotel Rwanda. And number three, a political body with the ability to maintain order, which is interesting because of the implication that not all nations are states um, secondary to internal chaos or lack of military or political strength. The United States is the most successful example of a nation state. Uh, John Jay, part of the Madison Hamilton Jay Trio from the Federalist Papers, notes in Federalist 2, quote, um, one connected country to one united people, descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs. End quote. This is actually uh, actually found part of the manuscript. The actual quote is not in this little section here. It'd be above it, but um, I don't think they found that one. But just as how people and populations change over time, what makes us united in the United States changes over time. Look no further than the 2000 census, as well as a more recent breakdown spanning 11 pages of origins of people in the United States. It's definitely e pluribus unum. Despite extraordinary advances in therapies, rates of cardiovascular death mortality remain high mainly because patients are not following ideal medical management. Guidelines that have been established have been estimated to account for maybe half of the 50% reduction in mortality from coronary artery disease in the past 20 years. It is estimated that 20% to 30% of patients do not adhere to curative or relieving medication regimens. And when it comes to long-term compliance um, required in things like post-MI care, 50% of patients fail to adhere to the prescribed regimen. In the European Union, where this study was done, uh, there are 194,500 deaths a year due to non-adherence to prescribed medications, and um, that slightly less unfortunately results in 125 billion euros annually, which is wild considering this problem is magnified in the wealthier countries where, where access to health care is pretty high. So it's um, pretty applicable. I know it's kind of silly to say, but when you're in clinic or doing admissions, go out of your way to combo things up. If they're inpatient, it's a great place to observe them while you're doing combo meds. 
Just as how combinations work in medicine, they are a surprising vehicle for our nation state. From the melange of people from all over the world comes uniquely American inventions. Blues, rock and roll, jazz, hip-hop, country, foods from barbecue to Tex-Mex to lobster rolls, and the milkshakes, burgers, and hot dogs of the world. Culturally, we all value personal freedom. We like basketball and baseball and football, and every four years we like soccer. Um, we have our own literature and invented a mythos and art form in the comic strip that is uniquely American. In school, everyone gets Christmas and Easter off. We celebrate Thanksgiving and all look forward to trick-or-treating during Halloween. And um, with that, I certainly wish all of you a happy Halloween.